Good evening. My name is Peter Christian Agner. I am the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here. It's another one of our conversations. If this is your first time with the Gotham Center, I invite you to learn more about us online at gothamcenter.org, where you can find nearly a thousand articles, hundreds of podcasts and event recordings, dozens of book talks, digital exhibits, and more on all things New York City history. Those of you looking for a deeper dive may also be interested in our online education program, Gotham Ed, at gothamed.com. Tonight, as part of our regular series featuring the best and most interesting new work on the city's history, we'll be discussing Mobilizing the Metropolis, How the Port Authority Built New York, written by Philip Mark Plotch and Jen Nellis, and published by the University of Michigan Press this summer. The Port Authority recently celebrated its 100th year anniversary and to discuss its history is to discuss, is really to discuss the history of an empire on the, on the Hudson, as one scholar put it. The Port Authority office itself is 50% larger in square feet than the Empire State Building, but the portfolio of transportation infrastructure that it manages is enormous, far larger even than its ambitious founders imagined. Although its name suggests that the Port Authority's main purview is, was shipping at first, it took some time actually for that authority to develop. Instead, during the early years, the port was responsible for planning and building some of the most iconic and important bridges and tunnels connecting New York to New Jersey. But today, it is responsible for managing not just local ports, shipping ports in the area, but a wide range of transportation infrastructure that includes five airports, four marine terminals, three bus stations, four bridges, two tunnels, as well as numerous real estate sites, including the World Trade Center. The diversity of this portfolio is also nowhere as important as the scale of each part of it. During many of these years, for example, half of all imports pass through New York City, as well as a quarter of all flights in the US. Car traffic, of course, in the region, always unrivaled. So the Port Authority is crucial to understanding the history of transportation in our area. Revolutions in economic, social, and political life are also often driven by revolutions in transportation, and that has been true in New York since the establishment of the Colonial Port and the building of the Erie Canal. Those early advances enabled the city to become a national headquarters for manufacturing, trade, financing, and much else by the point at which the Port Authority was established in 1921. But New York's vitality ever since was not simply guaranteed by this inheritance, as our guest tonight argues rather persuasively. It required constant wise management and planning. And the, P the Port Authority faced enormous challenges throughout, having to plan and manage transportation for a region that was fragmented physically in terms of its geography and politically in terms of governance. Without the kind of governmental powers that might have enabled to overcome some of those obstacles more easily. Its success as the nation's first Port Authority spawned 35,000 copycats around the country, making its history relevant well beyond the metropolitan area, but its failures have also been very significant, making it equally worthy of study. So with that bit of table setting out of the way, allow me to introduce our speaker tonight, who's exceptionally well placed to comment on both on the sort of inner workings of this uh, as a practitioner and as well as the history as a scholar. Phil, Philip Mark Plotch is the principal researcher at the Eno in Center for Transportation, a nonprofit independent think tank based in Washington, DC. He is perhaps best known for leading efforts to rebuild the World Trade Center as director of Redele redevelopment after the September 11th attacks and head of special projects at the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, where he, over where he developed new transportation programs, open spaces, and of course, we're building. Between 1992 and 2005, he was also the manager of policy and planning at the Metropolitan Transit Authority, the MTA, leading planning for the New York's uh, for New York's transportation system, including the seven subway extension to the Hudson Yards and the Second Avenue subway. In addition, he's a prolific writer, the author of Last Subway: The Long Wait for the Next Train in New York City, published by Cornell Press in 2020 and Politics Across the Hudson, the Tappan Zee Mega Project, published by Rutgers Press in 2015. He's published numerous articles and op-eds in a wide range of journals that I won't mention here, and is a recipient of the American Planning Association's Journalism Award for his research and analysis on the Tappan Zee Project, joining such prestigious past winners as Kate Asher, Paul Goldenberger, Ken Jackson, and Elizabeth Colbart. 
He's a fellow at the New York, uh, New York University currently, and in 2021 was a Fulbright Scholar and Visiting Professor at Sogang University in Seoul, South Korea, where he completed this book with his co-author, Jen Nellis. I'm delighted to welcome Philip back here to the Gotham Center. Philip is going to lead us in a presentation about the book, and then we'll have a conversation and we'll hear from you, um, have some time at the end for public Q&A. The usual bit of housekeeping is, as always, the chat feature has been disabled in Zoom uh, out of respect to our speaker. So I ask you to use the Q&A icon instead at the bottom of your screen. You can send us questions at any time and I encourage you to do so. With that said, uh, we'll begin answering your questions at 7.30 after the presentation and, and conversation. So with that, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Philip Mark Plotch. Thanks, Peter. I'm delighted and honored to be a guest here at the Gotham Center. So I'm going to bring up some slides, assuming we can get this thing to work. How do we do, Peter? Can you see them? We're good to roll. Great. Okay. So first, a little bit of background about myself, although we did have a quite a long introduction. Um, but the point I want to make for this is that to really understand how public agencies work, it, it's been an invaluable experience for me to work at public agencies. So working at the MTA, I dealt with the Port Authority. It helps me understand how public authorities work, which are slightly different than regular government agencies. And at Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, we work closely with the Port Authority to understand how they how they accomplish what they've been able to accomplish, how they overcome their challenges, and how they're not able to do the things that everybody wants them to do. So Peter mentioned I'm working at the Eno Center. Um, we're also a nonprofit. We're also nonpartisan, and we're also um, independent, and we have lots of our own great webinars um, that obviously focus on transportation. So this is what I wanted to talk about today. I want to talk about sort of the beginnings of the Port Authority over 100 years ago. Um, I want to talk about its, its heyday, because at one time, the Port Authority was probably the most well-respected, most well-known public organization in the United States, um, because it had accomplished so much. Um, talk about the airports competition that New York has faced for a very long time with its seaports. Talk about a plan that the Port Authority hatched up with Robert Moses. Um, so Robert Moses is not the only one who's built ambitious projects. And talk about the importance of coalitions and how one person was able to do that. So the book, Mobilizing the Metropolis, talks about successes, and it also talks about failures. People don't necessarily like to talk about failures. The Port Authority isn't one that's going to be publicizing their failures, but I think they're really important to understand because you can learn so much from them. So one of the things that I think it's really important to remember is the Port Authority is a bi-state organization, the first bi-state organization, um, as well as the very first public authority, as Peter mentioned, in the United States. And it's important, I think, for New York and New Jersey to work together. So I've lived in Queens and Brooklyn, Long Island, Manhattan, and New Jersey. So I have this sort of understanding about how the region works. Um, and when the two states fight, and I don't think anybody's better off. Um, and when they work together, everybody is better off, um, sort of like two siblings. Um, the family is better, be better, the siblings are better if they're getting along. So I'll go back since this is a history, history buff seminar, um, just to look to see what life was like when the Port Authority was started. So most people don't realize, although maybe Gotham Center folks do, that the country's major manufacturing center in the United States 100 years ago was Manhattan. It was sort of like the China of the world. Um, nearly a million people in New York were employed in the manufacturing center. And I think about my own grandparents, all four of them uh, came in the early 20th century and they all worked in the manufacturing center. So over hundred years ago, 
most of the nation's hats, leather goods, women's clothes, pipes and pens. They were made right here in New York, actually in Manhattan, for the most part below 59th Street. So nearly half of the jewelry and umbrellas and men's clothing was also made in Manhattan. And manufacturing helped New York become the center for insurance, the center for bike banking and, and all sorts of different financial industries, the center for stock exchanges, corporate headquarters and the media. But the reason that there was this manufacturing in the first place was because of the economic might, the port of New York and the port of New Jersey. So this is a great quote that I came across re recently is practically the entire foreign fruit trade of the United States was conducted in just a few sh short blocks on the Lower West Side of New York. So nearly half of the goods coming into the country were coming through the port of New York. So this is a photo of a banana boat. And if you look really closely, you can see some bananas in there. Um, so the steamships and railroads were bringing in apples from Oregon, grapefruits from Florida, pineapples from Hawaii, and they were traded here in New York. This is the Pier 27 in 1910. And you could imagine how many jobs there are loading and unloading these crates in the barrels. And New Yorkers are making a fortune because they're buying goods and then selling goods, right? Making the profit. They're storing them and they're financing them. They're transforming raw materials into finished products. You, you can see why people might have thought that New York streets were paved with gold. This is the a picture of the West Side about 100 years ago. You could see the West Side, it was one pier after another after another. Obviously, it looks very different. Now it's sort of one recreational pier after another recreational pier. And this is the New Jersey side. So if you look across the river from the west side of Manhattan, you can see lots of luxury homes in Hoboken, New Jersey City, Weehawken. So those places, especially Jersey City and Hoboken, had these massive rail yards, which is now which are now developed into residential areas. So the trains didn't cross the Hudson River. They terminated here. So if they were coming from Ohio or if they were coming from South Carolina, or wherever they were coming from, they ended up in, Jer in New Jersey. And then there was this little issue of how do you get across? So all the railroads are the west of the Hudson River. Most of the shipping and the trading is east of the Hudson River. You can see it's a bit of a problem. So as more goods are coming through the port, the waterfront is becoming increasingly congested and chaotic. So this is a photo of the Hoboken waterfront. You can see that trucks are waiting for the ferry. This is before the, the Holland or the Lincoln or the George Washington Bridge were built. You know, businesses throughout the region were concerned because they needed reliable and inexpensive transportation services. That was one of the great things about locating your business in New York because transportation was relatively inexpensive and it was quite reliable. Um, now, if Things are getting more chaotic on the land side and on the rail side and in the water. It's hurting the economy of New York and inhibiting the growth of New York's economy. And there was a recognition in 1921 that the two states needed to work together. Representatives from two states gathered to create the Port Authority in 1921. Now, to, important again to understand this distinction between a public agency like uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation or the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. that they, they report to the governor or to the mayor and their funding it relies upon the state legislature or city council. But that's not the way the public authority, the very America's very first public authority was set up. It wasn't gonna rely on the legislature for funding. Instead, it would have a board of directors or a board of commissioners and the two governors would appoint those men. Men, And of course it was men back in 1921. Um, and the board would decide where to invest the money and it would have to either break even or make a profit because it wasn't relying on public money. It started as an organization that was focusing on improving the ports, but it quickly morphed because it was looking for places where it could break even or be profitable. And those places included um, all of these things that Peter was mentioning before. So there's three bridges that connect Staten Island and New Jersey. 
There's the Holland, Lincoln, and George Washington Bridge. There, um, there's some industrial sites that they have, two huge seaports, one in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and one in Newark, New Jersey. It has does have some other seaports in Brooklyn and Staten Island as well. And it has the Port Authority bus terminal. Probably that's what it's best known for. Um, it has a bus station that you might have seen up at the George Washington Bridge, and it has the World Trade Center. Um, to me, it's sort of remarkable that this agency, which starts out making some money, nickels or quarters or dollars from operating bridges and tunnels, has the audacity and the resources to build the two tallest buildings in the world. So remember I said that the Port Authority its heyday was uh, one of the sort of most well-respected, well-known um, public agencies in the Western Hemisphere. So I want to tell you a little bit about the first person I interviewed for the book. Her name is Sandra Vanderwall, and she she's, uh, lives on the Upper East Side. Um, she graduated law school in 1955. She's since retired. Um, it was at a time where Wall Street firms, where she wanted to work, were not hiring women lawyers. Port Authority was hiring women lawyers. Um, and they were paying them, much to my surprise, she told me, the same as the Wall Street law firms. So right now, a Wall Street law firm is paying more than almost all the senior attorneys at the Port Authority. Um, but um, at the time, at, 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 at now, the um, there's such a, a huge dis difference and discrepancy between starting salaries at a place like the Port Authority and, and the Wall Street firms that the, the brightest students who are coming out of Harvard Law School or Columbia Law School or NYU Law School are not looking to join the Port Authority. And it's the same really with engineers and a, and a lot of staff that were attracted to the Port Authority that don't have that right now. Uh, Sandra told me a story, which I thought was kind of funny, which was the building. So the Port Authority's headquarters before the World Trade Center on 8th Avenue, and it's now the Google New Google's New York headquarters. And if you look really closely, you can see some markings that say Port of New York Authority, the old name for it. And she told me they had so much money that whenever she had a meeting at one of its airports, they would just, people like her, even as a, a new attorney, would just go to the roof of the building on 8th Avenue and they would take a helicopter to their meetings. But it was pretty sexist, even if they did hire women attorneys. She said they weren't allowed to use one of the Port Authority cars because they were afraid if the woman used one of the Port Authority cars, they were gonna go shopping. So it was okay to use a helicopter, but not one of the cars. Um, this is, just wanna show you some pictures of, to think about what they did um, and the innovation that they did. So we all know about the bus terminal, but it, to me, one of the most amazing things about the bus terminal is the ramps that connect the bus terminal with the Lincoln Tunnel. So the Port Authority um, purchased an entire square block very close to Times Square. So you, you could imagine that was not an easy thing to do. Um, they displaced about 640 families, something that you wouldn't see right now. Um, they're able to get all the buses off the street, um, not by only by consolidating all the different um, bus stations that were in New York from Greyhound and all of the other carriers, but also by these ramps where the buses were no longer coming in, onto the street and going into the into a bus station or a bus terminal. It, a huge benefit for New York that we don't really think very much about. Um, here's an example that some pretty clever engineers in the 1960s who came up with this idea for a catwalk. So the Port Authority had the resources um, as opposed to a city or state department of transportation because they were charging tolls. And they came up with this clever way that police officers could go back and forth and emergency personnel could go back and forth um, and they can help out uh, stranded motorists or people who are having a problem. Um, when you're collecting tolls, you're very sensitive to anything that might disrupt that flow of revenue coming in. And I'm not sure if people know this, but the busiest bus lane in the United States is not in New York, it's actually in New Jersey. Um, and it's a model for many other regions. It's called a contra flow lane. So you can see in the morning, all the buses are leaving Manhattan and going east, except for one lane in on one of those three lanes where the buses are coming in the other way. 
Um, I was talking to Leon Goodman. He's also, or um, he was also an old timer at the Port Authority, and he was telling me he came up with this idea for the contraflow lane. It never been tried anywhere in the world. It took him years to get approvals, but he had a lot of support from the Port Authority because at the time they were willing to take risks. They were innovative. He said that's not the kind of thing that would happen right now. Um, that idea of being able to take the risk and doing things that other people hadn't done before. Um, but one of the reasons they did it was because the Port Authority put a lot of money into research. They had a, a, a very strong network and they were able to get support from the police departments that along the, the corridor going into the Lincoln Tunnel and from state and federal officials who um, have to approve these kinds of things. So the theme of mobilizing the metropolis is how the Port Authority has been successful when it's created and take advantage of coalitions. So coalitions can be other government agencies. So it could be the MTA or it could be the city of New York. Civic groups, let's say business community or real estate interest or the regional plan association. Business leaders in all sorts of different formats and elected officials. So bringing those people together for a coalition is how you're able to get things done. And there's four ways they did that. They did that with their people, their expertise, their information, and their reputation. Those are all resources. So you have good people. They're known for their expertise, like the engineer who did the contrafo lane. They have information that other agencies need, and they have a good reputation. That helps them build support. The Port Authority also had certain powers, which were helpful. For example, they had a monopoly on Hudson River crossings. So no private organization, no city or state agency can build another tunnel or bridge between New Jersey and New York um, because the Port Authority was granted the power to have that monopoly. It's a, it's a powerful monopoly when it comes to bringing all the, the tolls in. They also had a, a culture which was conducive to building coalitions. It was an engineering culture that looked to solve problems, innovative and risk-taking. Um, it's a slightly different culture now. Um, and they had effective leadership. And what's important about that leadership to think about is it doesn't necessarily come from the very top. It doesn't necessarily come from the executive director or from the chair, but it, with the right kind of culture, that leadership can come anywhere in the organization. And since they weren't getting any checks from the state or the federal government, they had to be creative and they had to be entrepreneurial. They had to think about how can we make money? So I'm gonna talk about the airports and I'm gonna talk about how the Port Authority got the airports. So Port Authority in the beginning, in the 1920s and 1930s, it did not control the airports. The city of New York and the city of Newark, Newark did. So Austin Tobin's 39 years old and he was appointed the Port Authority Executive Director in 1942. Aggressive, ambitious, smart. He kept that job for 30 years, sort of like the Robert Moses of the Bi-State Agency. When he started 1942, in the middle of the war, he got together with his chief planner and they put together a, a report after some study about how the Port Authority could help some solve some of the region's problems after the war was over. So what could the Port Authority do? So one of the things they thought about was they could build a bus terminal, um, which the there was no one central bus terminal. The Port Authority thought maybe they could operate marine terminals. The city of New York and Newark had their own marine terminals at the time. They also thought maybe they could take a leading role in aviation. So Newark and the city of New York both had their airports, but they weren't really putting enough resources into them because you can imagine you're the mayor, and there's all these competing interests for your resources, like parks, schools, roads. Airports were not at the top of the list. What Austin Tobin was able to do was he was able to figure out how to make a profit from all of these things. So to me, the bus terminal is a really interesting one. So if you go back and you look at, at all of the analysis they did, they figured out that they could break even or make a profit from building the Port Authority bus terminal because they would charge buses to come in. They would have advertising within the bus terminal. They would have lockers where people would put nickels or quarters in and use them during the day. Um, and the, um, um, they would also rent out space, a supermarket, a bowling alley. So for them, 
they thought this was going to be a money making um, exercise. It turned out not to be. It turned out to be a, a, um, a sort of an albatross on their finances and still is, which is one of the reasons they've had so much trouble trying to replace the bus terminal because it's not a money making operation, unlike an airport terminal. So what Austin Tobin did was he put together a small team and his small team for aviation issued some reports. They did some research and then they started advocating for the region's interests in Washington, DC. So they would go before the federal agencies who were regulating airlines and regulating airports. And they would explain how those regulations should be shaped to help New York. Austin Tobin put a lot of money into public relations. He His public relations budget uh, out far surpassed any other public agency. So whenever they did something, they made sure the newspapers reported. So they shared the information about the Port Authority's research results and its accomplishments down in DC. And that created a really important asset for the authority and that was credibility and leadership in the aviation field. So Tobin was able to get New York City and Newark to give up their airports, not by directly convincing them, but by convincing airline executives and investment bankers, the media, that New York was in just a better position than New York or New York City to upgrade and operate those airports. And they could do it in a regional way where it wouldn't just be one city and another city, but thinking about them together and holistically. So the Port Authority had the expertise, it created its own expertise, and it also had the financial resources through those tolls to modernize those airports. So in 1947, the Port Authority took over those three airports. It doesn't own them. It actually entered into long-term leases that have since been renewed. And then the Port Authority poured millions of dollars into improving them. And passenger traffic went from 4 million a year to more than 15 million a year within about 10 years. Air mail and air cargo also tripled within about 10 years. And I think this is an interesting number. One third, or sorry, one quarter of all the United States airline passengers by the end of the 1950s were flying into one of those three New York airports. And most of the international flights going in and out of the United States were going through JFK. And there's sort of a theme that you might hear a few times today, which is if you're a business, you want to be located in a place where there's fast, frequent, and reliable transportation services. If it's manufacturing, you want to get your goods out. If it's an office, you want to attract a lot of people. If you rely on air service, you want fast, frequent, and reliable air service to all parts of the nation and the world. Um, it's really important in maintaining New York's position as the nation's financial center, commercial center, and also the cultural center. If you're located here, you can get to anywhere in the world fast, relatively expensive, relatively inexpensively, and hopefully reliably. And if we lose that, that is um, a potential problem for New York, which is what I want to talk about next. So if you've been to LaGuardia, it's amazing. It's We went from one of the worst airport terminals to one of the best airport terminals. Uh, Newark just built a new terminal too. It's also a, a great amenity for New York, but it doesn't really solve a capacity problem at the airports. So I looked the other day, if you go to this website called Air Advisor, it says these are the six worst airports for delays. It's not a great thing for New York to be number one, New York to be number two, and then Newark to be number three. So we already have the worst delays in the United States, and it's going to get worse. Delays, reliability, as the number of passengers continues to grow. And New York, unlike some other cities, doesn't have the room to expand its airport. It doesn't have the room to build a new airport. There's a whole chapter in the book that talks about this 10-year quixotic effort the Port Authority had to try to build a new airport in northern New Jersey. And they ran against one obstacle against another obstacle, and they weren't able to do it. So if you think about the three airports, one is next to Flushing Bay, that is LaGuardia Airport. One is next to Jamaica Bay, that's JFK Airport. And one is next to Newark Bay. So being next to a bay means one of two things. Either you need to fill some of that bay in to expand the airport, or it's so environmentally sensitive that you can't do that. And that has been the case 
so far in the history of those three airports. Some wetlands have been filled in, but it's something that nobody really wants to do right now. Um, and there's no room to expand those airports in other directions because either you hit a highway or you hit a residential area um, or you're hitting something else like, like New Jersey's Port of Newark is right next to their airport. So there's no political appetite right now in the New York region to expand its airport. And this is going to be a problem um, because when New York's aviation industry starts to get hurt more, when we start to see those delays hurt even more, um, it's not a quick thing to try to expand an airport or build a new airport. To me, this is an interesting number. If you look at the no, no, total number of runways that New York has, so we have eight in 1959. We built a new one in 1970, but we still have the same number of runways as we did 53 years ago. Um, and there's 10, 15 times as many people using the our airports. We've been able to get away with it because we first got rid of a lot of the private planes that were coming into those airports. Um, airplanes have gotten a lot bigger, so we're able to get a lot more people in and out. But at some time, at some point, we won't be able to uh, squeeze any more efficiencies out of those airports. So the next thing I want to talk about is the seaports. So this is a picture of the first container ship. It the first container ship in the world, or the first real modern container ship in the world, uh, set sail out of Newark Airport. I'm sorry, Newark Seaport. So when the Port Authority took over Newark Airport, they also took over the seaport. And that put them in competition with New York City-owned piers on the west side of Manhattan, on the east side of Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in Staten Island. And then the Port Authority had something that New York didn't have when it came to putting money or uh, uh, resources and the peers, it had more resources. It, and it also had the space to set up container ship yards. Um, that was something New York City doesn't have. There's no space for container yards in Manhattan or in Brooklyn. Um, and the Port Authority saw that as the future of, sh as, of shipping. As far back actually as 1921, they saw this potential of containers rather than those crates and barrels that you saw. So um, they acquired, the Port Authority acquired its first seaport in Newark in 1948. In 1956, the first container ship leaves. And then in 1962, the Port Authority opened up another huge container terminal. Um, and this was just dedicated to container terminals. And this is in Port Elizabeth. If you drive on the turnpike now, you could see bits and pieces of both the seaport and the airport. And what, what is sort of amazing about that seaport is how, many, how much goods come in and out in a rather efficient manner because of these containers. And also because a lot of the containers are going right onto, um, right onto trains. So the freight trains are taking them out to Midwest or taking them all across the country. So Port Newark and Port, Six, Port Elizabeth were very successful, but it hastened the demise of the piers in Manhattan. Um, they didn't have the container ships. It was much more expensive bringing goods in and out, in and out. So the Port Authority has been able to keep New York's ports, or I should say New Jersey's ports, um, as the neither number one or number two port in the United States. But it did that at the expense of the ports of Manhattan. Now, of course, the ports of Manhattan would have um, died a death at any point, but the Port Authority container ship ports definitely hasten that demise. So the Port Authority in many ways is a landlord. Um, it's a landlord at the seaports because it doesn't own the facilities that take the containers on and off. It doesn't own the ships. It doesn't employ the people who take the cargo on and off. It doesn't control or own the, the trains that are taking the people on and off. It's a landlord. Um, and as a landlord, it needs to work with its partners um, in order to compete with other regions. And that landlord that it, it is, it's the same at the airports. It doesn't own most of the terminals. Um, it's the same at the bus terminal. It doesn't operate the buses. And it, it's the same at the World Trade Center too. It, it's a landlord. It rents out space to people. So New York was set, Port Authority was set up to help New York and New Jersey compete with other regions. And at this landlord 
um, aspect of it is, I think, a really interesting one. And it requires the Port Authority in ways that are very, very different from other public entities to work with tenants. And if I think about my local mall, I live in northern New Jersey, there's a mall nearby. And I think about how that mall has to keep its tenants happy. Um, and if those tenants are happy, they're going to invest more in their stores and bring more people in. And that'll help the 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 mall attract more more people and everybody's better off. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the what the Port Authority was facing in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, more than half of the imports that are coming into the United States are coming in not from Europe like they were before, but they're coming in from Asia. And most of them that are coming in from Asia, they're coming into the port of Long Beach and the, the port of Los Angeles. And they're getting onto these double stack trains and they're going across the country. So instead of the goods coming directly into New York, they're going into California and then coming across. It's a huge concern in New York and New Jersey because that means there's fewer jobs in New York relating to cargo handling, warehousing, the logistics field, financing the operations, transportation in general, insuring all of this and all the other fields that are associated with it. So the Port Authority hired Lillian Barone, and Lillian Barone is a really special person. I learned as uh, we were as Jen and I were writing this book, she was mentioned by people who worked at the airports. She was mentioned by former Governor Christine. C uh, taught Whitman um, because of her expertise and because of she was strategic and resourceful. She was likable and tenacious, and she was able to get a lot done. So when she starts, New York and New Jersey are losing market share. And also the operations at the port were costly and inefficient because of work rules and just because of the logistics there. Lillian was the first woman in the world to head a major port um, and still today one of the best known. So to reduce costs, she had to convince all the other stakeholders that they had to make some sacrifices and make some changes. So those are the operators of the terminal, it's the labor, it's the people who are shipping stuff in and out, it's the logistics firm who are figuring out where everything is going to go. All of these different firms, she had to convince them to make changes because they would all be better off. And the other things he did, I th and I think this is really amazing. She, when she started, she wanted to study where cargo was coming into the United States and how it was being routed to its final st destinations. And one of the things she realized was trade at the time a lot was coming from Japan and Korea, but there seemed to be a shift towards more of the Southeast Asian countries, Singapore and Thailand and then China too. And she and her team realized that if more of those goods were being shipped from Southeast Asia rather than from the Northern Asian part, that the goods could go instead of across the Pacific to California, um, they could go through the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic into New York. So to me, this is sort of an amazing that there's somebody working at a public agency in New York at the World Trade Center at the time, who decides that if we all we have to do is reroute traffic and we can have a thriving port again. Um, obviously, it's not an easy thing to do, but she and her team guessed right. And what she did was she got one and then two and then three and then four and then seven different shipping carriers to use the Suez Canal route. And as the manufacturing moved, Singapore became the world's busiest port. Um, and there's something that Lillian did, it wasn't just bringing more of the ships into New York's port and having the traffic go up again, but she signaled to the entire industry. So to everybody who has to invest in ships and ports and carriers and manufacturers, that the Port Authority was willing to be aggressive to pursue new business. They were going to put in the resources that they need to make sure that New York's ports succeeded. And that reputation was really important to get others to invest in the Port Authority's own facilities. So a few more things I want to talk about. Uh, this one I think is interesting. This is the, the Robert Moses Austin Tobin plan. So we're going to go back to the 1950s here. So in, in 19, 
53, the Port Authority's planners were thinking that maybe they needed another tunnel. So we had the Lincoln Tunnel, we had the Holland Tunnel, we had the George Washington Bridge. They thought we needed to get, because the traffic was so bad that maybe we needed another tunnel or another bridge into midtown Manhattan or lower Manhattan. But they they conducted a lot of studies because they um, were had probably one of the best transportation planning departments at the time in the United States. And they also were anticipating some federal funding for highways. So what they did was they sketched out this plan to accommodate the growth that they expected. And the study showed that it wasn't people weren't necessarily going into Manhattan anymore, to Midtown or Lower Manhattan. They were going around Manhattan. That's where they wanted to go. To Queens, Westchester, to Rockland County, Westchester County, Long Island, New Jersey. And they saw that's where the suburban growth was heading to. So they put together this plan. Um, Austin Tobin went out to Robert Moses' office in um, on Randall's Island, and he showed how they could together, using their resources and the expected federal funding, a Route 80, it didn't have that name at the time, uh, uh, a highway could be built in northern New Jersey that would connect into the George Washington Bridge. Another level of the George Washington Bridge could be built. It had one level when it was built, and the thinking was that rail could be added at, at some point but it never became financially feasible because nobody makes any money on rail. It's just a losing proposition. Um, there was a, a little section of Manhattan when you get off the George Washington Bridge, a little uh, by 95. Um, they also, the Port Authority planners also said this was a good time to build the Throgs Neck Bridge. Um, and in the South, to build an expressway across Staten Island. And it was a good time to build this bridge across the Narrows, which became the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. So this was great for the Port Authority because it's going to have even more revenue because you're talking another level of the George Washington Bridge at two levels, which is one of the reasons why it's it's the world's busiest crossing right now. And the Port Authority had three bridges between New Jersey and New York, but it wasn't getting a lot of traffic. But if, you, if the Staten Island Expressway was built and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, then all of a sudden these three bridges could be used a lot. So the two men together, and they both had good PR teams, were able to convince New York City, New York State, and New Jersey to support their plan. And it was a big deal. It was a big deal today. It's a big deal back then. And this is, sort of, I think, interesting what, what the commentators were saying at the time. So editorials, um, different pundits were saying things like awe-inspiring um, and the region's in for the greatest concentration of highway and bridge building that the world perhaps has ever seen, projects of almost staggering proportions. So we don't build anything like this today. So if you think about the infrastructure we built, a lot of it is either relatively small or it's replacing existing infrastructure. But this was an era where mega projects were done on a more routine basis. So the last thing I want to talk about was a gentleman named Lou Gambaccini, who I never met. He passed away a few years ago, but his name came up over and over again. And it made me think about how a public official, he wasn't the head of the Port Authority, but somebody who's really dedicated to public service, somebody who has a really big Rolodex. And if you're under 30, a Rolodex is something that lists all the different people's names and phone numbers. Um, and how you can make a difference, even if you don't have billions of dollars, to build new infrastructure. So in the 1970s and 80s, Lou Gambaccini was the head of the PATH train. That's the train that connects Jersey City, Hoboken, Newark with Manhattan, 33rd Street, Greenwich Village, and the World Trade Center. Um, he's, he was the head of the PATH. He, then he became the assistant executive director at the Port Authority. And no one knew how to build coalitions better than Lou Gambaccini. So here's a story that doesn't have a success, but what it does has, it, it shows that even if you're not successful, if your organization is willing to take risks, um, and if you're willing to be innovative, it's okay to fail sometimes and keep on going. So before the internet, the transit agencies in New York were getting about 20,000 phone calls a day. So people are looking for schedule information. It's hard if you're not from New York or you're not used to transit to figure out how to go from one place to another by public transportation. So I said, I live in Northern New Jersey. Um, and if I wanted to go to the Upper East Side, let's say I wanted to go to a museum, back then 
you would have a whole bunch of different schedules. And there were so many different ways of doing it. Would I take the bus over the George Washington Bridge? Would I take the train into Penn Station? Would I take the bus into the Port Authority? Which bus? What time does it leave? How often? How do I pay? Um, how long does it take? Um, so many different questions. And you have to call all of these different organizations, right? You have to call the bus company. You have to call the railroad. You have to call the transit authority and the path train. So Lou Gambaccini said there has to be a better way. So we invited all the transit agency representatives to the World Trade Center. And he tried to convince them there should just be one central place, one phone number that you call and you get all this information. And he had meeting after meeting and put a lot of time and Port Authority resources to figuring how to do it. But the others just weren't willing to, to do it. They didn't want to give up that power. But he didn't give up. He decided he was going to build other kinds of coalitions. So he was concerned as the head of the path that the system couldn't accommodate many more riders. The number of passengers was increasing in the early 80s by about 5% a year. He knew building a new rail tunnel was going to take a long time. Actually, the access to the Regents Corps started under Lou Gambaccini's planning. Um, access to the Regents Corps was killed, and that got turned into Gateway, which is the new tunnel that Amtrak is planning on building between New York and New Jersey. That got started under Lou Gambaccini. Well, he knew it was going to take a long time to build a rail tunnel. He knew you couldn't just add another tunnel. Nobody wanted a new tunnel into Manhattan. And the only way to accommodate more people, he figured, was to use the water. At the time, the only commuter ferry in the New York area was the Staten Island Ferry. Um, and he, he had to fight a little bit to get this because the Port Authority board didn't want to run ferry services. They just saw this is a money losing operation. Um, the executive director didn't think it was a good idea. He didn't think it would attract very many people, but he was convincing. Um, he had the numbers to show this could work. Um, and he convinced the Port Authority not to run the service, but just to build the ferry terminals, kind of like it does having a bus terminal or an airport terminal, the World Trade Center, right? Being that landlord again. Um, so it built a ferry terminal in on the New York side, a temporary one that later became a permanent, permanent one, the same in Hoboken. And now the ferries are quite established all throughout the, um, the New York Harbor. So there was something else he did. So from his own experience, he saw problems when agencies weren't working together. So an example is, when one agency is doing construction work without coordinating each other. So let's say there's two parallel roads. One is, let's say, the Northern State Parkway, Long Island Expressway, or another is the New Jersey Turnpike and the Garden State Parkway. So what sometimes the agencies were doing is because they weren't planning and coordinating with each other, they would both undertake construction on parallel places. So you couldn't go from one to another um, if there was a problem. So. Drivers were getting stuck needlessly because the agencies weren't coordinating. The second problem he noticed was one day he was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike coming back from Trenton and he hit this really bad traffic at the Lincoln Tunnel. And he realized if he had some sort of a sign that had told him in advance that there's traffic at the Lincoln Tunnel, go to the Holland Tunnel, he would have been much better off. But there wasn't those signs because the agencies weren't really talking to each other. So what he did was he invited representatives from 15 different highway agencies and police departments together to figure out how to share information. And he created this organization that's still around. It's called Transcom, T-R-A-N-S-C-O-M. And somebody told me who was at that first meeting when he brought everybody together at the World Trade Center that he envisioned something that didn't exist at the time. Traffic management from a multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional concept. And people from all over the world actually still come to visit Transcom to see how they do. It, here in California, it's not as important to bring different states together or different jurisdictions together, but there's so many in the New York area. There's so many police departments, so many transportation agencies. Uh, just by bringing them together, sharing information, and that information can then get disseminated to the agencies and also to us. So a lot of their information that they're collecting, we end up seeing when, if, when we're using Google Maps or Waze. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to go from one place to another because people are sharing this information. He also created something called the Transit Center. Uh, a gentleman in Gambaccini's department, Larry Filler, had this idea about bringing all the transit agencies together, 
and taking advantage of something that the Port Authority and the MTA were able to get the IRS to do, which was to allow people to get up to $15 in some sort of a voucher they could use at any transit agency and not be taxed on that. So Larry Filler, uh, who had 100% support from Gambaccini, brought the trans transit agencies together. He created, and nobody had ever done this before, something called a transit check, which employers could give to their employees, use on any of the transit services. Um, and then Larry and the transit center helped other cities do the same thing. And because he helped other cities do the same thing, he created this national support to increase the tra transit tax benefit, which is why millions of people now are able to get a tax exemption of $300 a month um, instead of just $15 a month because they were able to build that support in Congress. Again, it was creating this coalition and it was sort of unwittingly creating a national coalition by starting with that regional coalition. All right, so the last one is Easy Pass. So I'm going to give this credit to Gambaccini, even though he never said, hey, let's create the world's largest electronic toll collection system in the world. But his legacy inspired people inside and outside the Port Authority to do so. So those people who were working at Transcom started to know each other. They started to trust each other because they're sharing information all the time about what's going on with tra traffic and construction. And those people decided to create this group where they were going to have these electronic tolls. Now, without this group, believe it or not, you might be driving around with an MTA tag, a Port Authority tag, a New Jersey Transit, Trans I'm sorry, a New Jersey Turnpike tag, a Thruway Authority tag, but they got together and they said they, they can uh, uh, create something that everybody can use. So he has quite a legacy, um, Lou Gambaccini, the ferries, the Transcom, the Easy Pass, and the Transit Center. And the last thing I just wanted to say was when the states work together, we're all better off. And when the states don't work together, we're not. Um, I can think of an example. I remember working on the, the 2020, bill, 2020 bid for the New York City Olympics, and we did not get the Olympics. We lost to London. And one of the reasons was because we didn't work with New Jersey. So we couldn't find a suitable site to hold the Olympic ceremonies and um, have one big Olympic stadium. We first tried to do the West Side of Manhattan and that got that that got turned down. Um, and we wouldn't want, New York didn't want to work with New Jersey. So because of that, um, we lost the Olympics. And we can see what's going on with congestion pricing right now. Um, one state is suing another state. Um, and if the two of them work together, the resources from congestion pricing could help both states. So just a couple of more things just to think about is how the Port Authority could really make a big difference. Um, right now, if you think about somebody coming in to Newark Airport and they want to get to Kennedy to figure out how to go from one transit service to another, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, even, even if you can figure out the schedules online with Google Maps or something, it's still really hard to figure out how you get on the air train, how you get New Jersey transit into Penn Station, what you do at Penn Station, how you buy your fare, what you pay for. Um, it, I think it'd be great if we can have our agencies work together on something like that. And the other thing I think about a lot is we're a region that doesn't have great bus service in the region. And one of the reasons we don't do that is because the city, state agencies, and multiple states, they haven't figured out like a network that would help improve buses. I think that's really important because we're not going to be building much more rail because it's so incredibly expensive and we're not going to be expending our, uh, expanding our highway network. So there's lots more in the book. If you're curious, I think learning more about the arrogance of the Port Authority in history was interesting. Rudy Giuliani um, and his relationship with the Port Authority, political scandals are always fun to learn about. Um, the building of the World Trade Center, and the rebuilding of the World Trade Center really show the difference between the Port Authority's power um, and also why the Port Authority could replace a bridge at one era, but not in the other. So, Peter, thanks. Hopefully it wasn't too long. And I'm going to stop sharing right now. Well, I am, as you described yourself in the book, um, uh, a, 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 you know, junior transportation dork. So um, I, I would be happy to... Um, 
uh, hear you talk for another hour about it. Um, I, um, I mean, I, as I said to you before, you know, we transportation is one of these things. It's, it's hugely important. Everything. It's, 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 it's the bedrock for all these other things that we sort of take for granted. Um, it's amazing to me that um, it doesn't get more sort of uh, attention. Um, we are out of time. I want to say you know, we're almost sort of out of time for uh, what we're going to sort of uh, some of the questions we were going to um, we were discussing beforehand and the kind of things we want to talk about. So I want to sort of uh, we're we've got we're hoping to sort of start the public Q and A in a little bit. So I'm going to have to unfortunately not throw all the questions at you that I want to throw at you. <laughs> Um, uh, so I have to sort of, you know, decide which one of my, uh, uh, of my children to kill here, but, um, let's, let's jump into one of the things you sort of alluded at the end there, you know, you're, you're sort of alluding to this along the way in recent year, you know, the, the Port Authority has, is, is, is this sort of incredible institution. It, it creates all these sort of, it has those, those, uh, tremendous achievements to its name in the first 50 years. But you know it's come under attack in in recent years, uh, and and uh, as you note in the book, doesn't sort of attempt these sort of uh, mega projects that sort of characterize a sort of golden age, the heyday, right? Um, and you have you have I think um, several thoughts on this, but one of the things you sort of emphasize is that there's a big turning point in the '90s, um, where they lose the political independence that you that you identify, and, and I think persuasively is one of the key. Um, cornerstones of their success in that heyday period. Do, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Then we get to bring up Rudy Giuliani and political scandals and all there those other go. things that yeah, we don't exactly. think we're going to get to. So um, in, I think it was the 1993 race, um, Mario Cuomo, the incumbent governor, was running against um, George Pataki. Sort of nobody really knew who George Pataki was. He was sort of this no-name set, state senator from Westchester County. Um, and Rudy Giuliani, the Republican, crossed party lines to support Mario Cuomo. And George Pataki won the race, and he never forgave or forgot what Rudy Giuliani had done. So when he came in, he decided he was going to put Rudy Giuliani's arch enemy in as char in charge of the Port Authority, somebody who didn't really like the mission of the Port Authority, um, somebody who really was a big cost cutter for government. And he started to slash the Port Authority staff. The salaries were no longer as high as a lot of the state agencies. Um, it, it lost um, a lot of the kind of pa institutional knowledge and resources that really made it a special agency. Um, and I think that was one of the problems. But the other problem that occurred at that point was the because the New Jersey governor wasn't so crazy about this executive director that George Pataki was able to bring in, she said, we want a deputy executive director. So the deputy executive director, it became this, this new role where the governor of New York would get the executive director position and the New Jersey governor would get the deputy executive director position. And what happened at the Port Authority, it, these two fiefdoms started um, where they were barely even talking to each other and starting to compete. So where the Port Authority had a lot of independence, all of a sudden the two governors are bringing their people in and doing what's best for the two governors. It's also a time where traffic volumes aren't going up as, as much and they're starting to level off, which means there's less money to come to come in, which means they need to raise fares more often. And to raise fares, they needed the governors okay with it. And the two Republican governors were both cost-cutting governors who were looking to cut taxes. And they saw the Port Authority as a, oh, here's a place for some resources. So it was just a, a bad time because the new head of the Port Authority, he's kind of weak and is looking to cut costs. The two fiefdoms are started. Port Authority doesn't have as many resources before. And the governors of New York and New Jersey start to use the Port Authority as a piggy bank. So it loses its independence. It loses its credibility. It loses a lot of its staff. And it's it, it hasn't never really fully recovered for what happened in the 1990s. Um, and uh, I, that's why the, the chapter is called The Turning Point. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you make a good point earlier on that, that the irony is that there was because the Port Authority had this bi-state regional sort of authority, there were attempts to uh, prevent its creation, to take away some of its authority in its early days within um, within parts of both of these states. Um, and yet you note that the irony was that the Port Authority's success in the Haiti period sort of brings these two states together, right? To your theme of like, they both prosper um, 
when they're they're, they're collaborating. Um, and then in this period of sort of decline where the two states are falling apart, um, we see the, the, um, the results in a way, I guess, in, in the absence of these mega projects. Yeah, I think um, I think I, there is there is this um, incident which everybody knows about, um, Bridgegate, which happened because one governor created this power base and another governor created this other power base, and one governor decides that or her his office can use the Port Authority as political payback against the Fort Lee mayor and closing lanes, um, and the other side of the Port Authority, including the executive director, didn't even know what was occurring. Uh, it was, it's, it's, it's a, a real stain on the Port Authority's reputation, and it takes a long time to bring back that credibility after something like that happens. Um, I want to remind everyone again to send in questions, and we've already got um, a, a good number of them, so I'm not going to I'm not going to ask too many. I think we'll turn it over to the audience in a second. Um, but I wanted to um, there, there's there's so much I would, would like to talk about. Um, this is a fantastic book. I want to congratulate you if I, if I didn't do that already. Uh, it, it's really, it was really um, a fascinating uh, read, um, very artfully done um, for such a big sprawling topic for an agency that, that um, has, a, it's, it's, it was quite enjoyable. Um, and, um, you know, this is, this is uh, a bit of a, you know, question about the other constraining factors that that sort of mark this latter period, and there's there's several, and they're sort of obvious, right? You, you sort of alluded to it before when we were talking about airports, right? Like the the uh, the the city is limited in how much it can sort of uh, expand those areas, and this and that chapter about the attempt to uh, build the the um, fourth major airport in the Great Swamp area, which then sort of gets pushed over to Stewart Airport, which never really quite becomes what they sort of hope that it might become. Um, this is about sort of uh, a sense of the, in the what, I mean, in a way it sort of seemed to me, you know, it's, this is, this is sort of the paradox of growth, right? It creates this sort of, um, it builds up this region and there's this sort of constant sort of desire of course for that growth but it, then the, the costs uh, uh start to materialize in terms of you know, congestion the uh, environmental degradation of the, the shrinkage of these sort of spaces um i wonder if um i mean you know just on the question of airports like what what are, are do you see opportunities did, did like do doing this work did that did, did it in doing the work that you do generally, did, did uh, um, do you do you see that built environment as just too constraining a factor? You know, what what could New York do in that area? Just with New York's with airports, I mean, I think you could sort of take this in a bunch of different areas. You have similar com, com, uh, comments in the sections about highway fatigue and things, but yeah, so. Um, remember, I worked at the MTA. I wrote a book about the Second Avenue subway, which took 100 years to build, or yeah. took 100 years to build one quarter, which makes you wonder if it's going to take another 300 years to build the next three quarters. So, um, build building... what? Like the majority of the system in like 10, 20 years, right? It's, you know, it's so, but that's, but that's when there's sort of this open space. And, you know, this is kind of what I mean. It's like, you know, the, the, it's sort of, it's more difficult once, once the environment sort of built up, right? So that's, part of it is more difficult, but there are other countries that do it. But Americans are very sensitive and New Yorkers are ultra sensitive to anything that might disrupt their daily lives. So in order to build a subway, you have to dig up a street. To do that, that means you have to stop the utilities, right? So it's water. Imagine the, turning off the internet to some somebody or turning off the sewer. So all of these like pipes conduits cables are all underneath the street um so and you have to disrupt uh, traffic and you take away parking and there's noise and so building a subway which is underground which shouldn't be that big of an issue can be problematic building an airport is just a hundred times harder because of the space requirements um and we're very sensitive not to just to noise and traffic but also very sensitive to effects on the wildlife so we're also very sensitive to historic properties. So when the Port Authority built the bus terminal, they took an entire square block of Manhattan. They moved 640 families. Um, and 
there wasn't a big uproar. The, at the time, people just thought, okay, this is the price of progress. People just have to move. Um, there wasn't concern about uh, the vehicles coming in and out and what it might do to traffic if you have a big bus terminal, even with the ramps. Um, instead, it was, okay, this is just what we need to do. And that's not how New Yorkers are now. New Yorkers are, aren't thinking that um, it's okay to fill in, in the bay or they're, not, they're thinking it's okay to knock down old buildings. Um, I came across some uh, work that the Port Authority did in Brooklyn, and they were really proud because they were knocking down pre-Civil War buildings. Like, hey, hey, we get to knock these old buildings down. And I'm just thinking, oh, no, they knocked down pre-Civil War buildings. But you can't go back 50 years or 80 years in time and tell them not to do something, right? So because of that sensitivity, it's just really hard to do something. I spent a year in Korea in 2021, and I was amazed by what they're able to build. Um, they also have very dense cities. Um, but they were able to say, we're going to build a new island. And on this new island, we're going to build an airport. Hong Kong did the same thing. They built an airport with on a new island. Um, or they say, we're going to move 10,000 people, right? Or we're, people aren't going to live on the Rockaways anymore. Or if they do, they're going to live in a really dense little corner, and the rest can be an airport. So like it's, it's all doable. Even with the, the growth we have, it's just something that we don't want to do. It's a choice that we make as a society. Um, and for better or worse, we think it's really important to protect historic properties, to make sure that people are comfortable, and to protect the environment. Yeah, well, this so, so this leads to the and what this will be my last uh, uh, question, and then we'll we'll turn to the audience. Um, but um, it's a speculative question. We had some back and forth about this beforehand, but you know, um, it gets to this larger question. It, it's it's historic preservation. It's environmental conservation. Um, but it's also some, uh, about the sort of, you know, miasma sort of, uh, you have this quote that I just love, uh, you know, from, uh, I think it's from Robert Wood's book, 1400 Governments, um, you know, that calls like governance in the region, one of the great unnatural wonders of the world, right? And, and the <laughs> yeah. title of that book is, is refers 1, to 1400 government. different yeah. governmental sort of <laughs> agencies that you find, yeah. which, you know, in America, this anti-government country where actually there's just, just like mind boggling sort of level of, of governance everywhere. Um, you know, this is a, this is a, um, a, a constraining factor for the Port Authority too, right? I mean, they, they find ways around with issuing bonds and tolls and things like that to raise revenue, but they don't have sort of government powers, right? You sort of use this app metaphor comparing them to like the UN in terms of the, di the distance between their powers and the, and the mission um, in the introduction. Um, and I wonder, you know, do you see, we hear this a lot, right? That like, you know, we could sort of, it would be cheaper to do things maybe, or, or at least feasible to do things if we had more sort of regional planning, regional sort of governance. And things like that. Do you see opportunities for that? You sort of made an illusion in one of your um, slides about, you know, ways we would coordinate transportation. Um, one of the things about the U.S., it's, you know, it's the unusual power of zoning at the local level. It's it's the it's the sort of lack of coordination between the sort of different transportation sectors, all private, et cetera. You know, we, you could sort of go down the rabbit hole on, on these sorts of legal questions, uh, structural questions, but do you see... Um, do you see anything sort of shifting in the, in the future as, as the Port Authority is facing, as we're collectively facing these transportation challenges going ahead? Or so this was a so you you I just want to say you complimented the book, and I wish Jen Nellis was able to be here. She's a my brilliant co-author who's also an expert in regional governance. Um, so living where I do in New Jersey, I realize how hard it is to consolidate governments. People would rather pay more taxes than be associated with a government that they think is inferior to theirs. So people are okay consolidating if they think they're going to get something better out of it. So I remember for a long time, Staten Island was talking about seceding and it still comes up every once in a while, yeah. but they, they only do that when they think that Manhattan is a burden on them and they're not doing as well. So, um, so it's, it's hard to get people together. So something you mentioned in the very beginning, you call this a transportation book. And in many ways, I think it's more than that. I think it's a transportation and economic development book. And a lot of the things that you talk about are, aren't are just transportation when you talk about regional issues. So climate change. Um, clearly, the city of New York is not going to figure out what to do with the harbor um, and with their rivers and with their streams um, by themselves, right? Or housing. So 
the city of New York has come to realize that they cannot solve the housing problem by themselves. They need the suburbs and uh, the suburbs have been loath to help out. Um, we saw that last year during the budget negotiations. And if the city of New York could work with the state of New Jersey and the state of New York to solve some of these problems, climate change, transportation, alternative sources of energy, we're all better off. Well, and it points back to it. You make a comment quick. This will be the end. Um, but, you know, um, governance is, is inevitable, right? Like, um, and so it's about sort of how you're structuring and approaching these questions. Um, Okay, so uh, we've got 20 minutes here. Let's see how how uh, uh, um, uh, ninja-like I can be in sort of dispatching some of these questions. So Peter Tannen, hi to Peter, thanks for joining us again. Um, what was the airport that had the new runway built? Uh, that was Newark Airport and that was in 1970. So, which means planning started in the mid 1960s to build a new airport. Um, I'm sorry, to build a new runway. Um, it take a lot longer now to build that new runway. Uh, Anita Altman asked, uh, what about Stewart Airport? That's the fourth airport that um, that we mentioned. I don't know if you want to add anything there. I do, I do, because there's this chicken egg, chicken and egg thing with Stewart Airport, which is really interesting to me. So because not a lot of people want to go up to Stewart Airport, it's up um, off the New York State Thruway in Orange County. So you drive past Rockland County, you get to Orange County. It's like it's, uh, it's near Newburgh, New York. Um, it's almost halfway to, to Albany. Um, uh, and that's considered now New York's fourth major airport. So the airlines aren't going because they don't have a lot of passengers. And the passengers aren't going because there's not a lot of airlines. Passengers want to go to an airport where there's multiple flights. Because if you get there and there's a 1230 flight and there's not another one for the rest of the day, you're screwed. So People want to go where there's a lot of flights, but the airlines aren't going there because there's not a lot of passengers. So it's that chicken and egg syndrome uh, that it just hasn't, I guess would be a good pun, that it just still hasn't gotten off the ground. Um, Michael Michione. Hi, Michael. Uh, does the potential end of Rikers Island as a jail represent an opportunity for LaGuardia to expand its size and capacity? So there was an op-ed about this in the New York Times. I think George Hycalis wrote this. Mm -hmm. um, George Hyde Hollis was a, a, a sort of a visionary. Um, sometimes you can be a little too visionary and uh, you can say something that might not be very feasible. It's hard to imagine that Rikers Island is gonna empty out of every single person. Um, and it's hard to imagine that people in Northern Queens are gonna be okay expanding that airport over there. Um, also building another airport so close to LaGuardia is problematic because it's not as efficient as if you can get out of the airspace of New York. So the the runways of the three airports in New York and New Jersey, they they all have to work together. So the air traffic controllers of all three airports have to work together to make sure there's no conflict. Sort of amazing to think that you can have all those airplanes coming in and out and we've never really had a, an air a near miss as far as I know in in modern days. I don't know of any. Um Philip writes, uh, different Philip, obviously, a great presentation. Um, Roger Gilman, director of the uh, PANYNJ planning and development in the 60s and 70s, was his boss. Oh. And during that period, shared the following regarding the failed airport, failed effort to create that fourth airport. Tobin was so focused on seeking the best location to meet technical and engineering and logistical objectives he wouldn't accept Gilman's strategic advice to just make the case for a fourth airport and not do what was done. Um, the PA Port Authority staff identified the ideal best location as Great Swamp near some of the wealthiest communities, mm -hmm. including some where several commissioners lived. Uh, Gilman tried and failed to convince Tobin to provide three or four possible locations so the conflict would be over which location instead of accepting whether or not to do the fourth airport. Well, first I wanna to say to Philip, uh, if we write a sequel to this book, please reach out to me because clearly you know things that I didn't completely I've know. i copied his uh, contact information. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So the Great Swamp is this fascinating episode in the sort of Hebrew and arrogance of the Port Authority, thinking they could build an airport, which was I think about 10,000 acres um, uh, and they That's thought they great. could 
build that in northern New Jersey. And they had been able to build the bus terminal. I said they could move 640 families. They were able to build one level and then two levels of the George Washington Bridge and displace a lot of people. Lincoln Tunnel displaced a lot. But what they didn't know was you can't displace really wealthy, well-connected people. Um, and they they hit a wall there. And it, so to me, it's a really fascinating to think, to, same with Robert Moses, right? Robert Moses was able to get so much done, um, whether you liked it or not, in the Bronx, because he wasn't moving out um, politically influential people. Um, uh, Hal Eskenazi writes, I had occasion last year through Open House New York, um, a fantastic organization that we love, of course, to be invited on a boat ride through the inner works of the port. Uh, uh, what is out of sight to most people, but phenomenon is the inner working of shipping storage and movement. They told us about how truckers call in advance and schedule pickups. So organized, so interesting. What's next? I think that's more of a, a comment than a, uh, but. Well, I, I would say that clearly automation is what's next, right? That it's, it's, but now you can have, which is absolutely phenomenal, you can have 20,000 containers on one ship and just a handful of people on one of those ships and just a handful of people taking everything off in about six or eight hours. Um, but maybe you could uh, say that about every industry in the world, right? Automation. Right. Yeah. Um, Andrew Sparberg. Hi, Andy. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. was wondering why you left out the story of how the PA and NYNJ took over the H&M and morphed it into PATH. To my mind, PATH is a mass transit success story not always recognized. H&M was bankrupt before the PA took it over. Uh, Lou Gambaccini should also be recognized. Uh, I think this is a separate comment. Um, okay, so here's a plug. Andy Sparberg has written a book about New York City subway and thanks Andy for that yeah. great book. And uh, I saw one of his great presentations. Um, so I couldn't cover everything in a half hour, um, but in the book, there's a, there's a whole chapter about the World Trade Center. And the H&M Railroad was a bankrupt railroad that ran between New Jersey and New York. And the state legislators in New Jersey wanted the Port Authority to help rescue that railroad. They blamed the Port Authority for bankrupting it because the Port Authority built the tunnels and the bridges, which took people out of railroads and put them into cars. Um, the Port Authority wanted nothing to do with public transportation because they saw it as a money loser um, and hemorrhaging money. But Austin Tobin, the, the Port Authority's executive director for 30 years, really wanted to build his World Trade Center towers. So he agreed to take over the H&M Railroad if he could get his World Trade Center towers built. And he made a whole bunch of other promises too. So the passenger cruise terminal on the west side of Manhattan, that was also a a gift to the mayor in order to get the mayor's support. Um, there's a office building on 125th Street in East Harlem, and that was done by New York State, and that was a gift to the civil rights leaders who were protesting why you're putting all these resources into Lower Manhattan. So if you want to build a big multi-billion dollar project, you have to start giving away gifts to different people. And the PATH train has in, been in so much better shape than the New York City subways. It didn't go through that down period of all of that graffiti and breaking down regularly because the Port Authority has so much more resources to put into it than the MTA. The MTA has always been bankrupt or teetering on bankruptcy. The Port Authority has been flush with cash thanks to their airports, their bridges, and their tunnels. Um, Mike Krieger notes, I also worked on a project to move all the runways at JFK offshore to allow for increased runway capacity to free up existing land for new, better terminals, freight facilities, et cetera, and to remove noise pollution. It is possible since there is an area offshore where depth of water is relatively shadow, shallow, others too thought about concentrating other undesirable quote unquote land uses offshore, LNG terminals and so forth. Um, call me here if you're interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> So you come to the Gotham Center and you meet all the right people. <laughs> I told you that there would be people in the audience that uh, that uh, knew their stuff. Yeah. So that's a, it's it, it was something that's sort of been bandied about for a while to build like sort of an island airport, but it's just a hard thing to do in New York. Um, building uh, wind wind farms 
20 miles out from the coast is something that people are okay with. Building an airport a mile from the coast is, isn't isn't something that everybody's crazy about. Um, lots of airport questions. So Stephen Marmon, is there any way that PANY could take a role in connecting JFK to Manhattan, LaGuardia, et cetera? So the Port Authority has always wanted what they call that one seat ride, which means yeah. you take a train from the airport and you get into New York. Um, they got as close as they could by getting to Howard Beach, where you can connect with the subway, and Jamaica, where you can get a Long Island Railroad. They tried really hard to get LaGuardia connected by rail. Um, and Newark, there's been a lot of talk for, I think, since the 1960s. So we're talking 70 years that you would have the PATH train, which goes from the World Trade Center on 33rd Street to go all the way to the airport. Right now it goes Newark. Uh, the city of Newark has the, is the last PATH station. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a, if, if you were going to plan from scratch how to connect the airports with the rest of the region, you wouldn't do it the way it is right now. Um, but the Port Authority just hasn't, they don't have the resources to do what they'd really like to do. And you think that's more important than the governance questions? One more time. What what what, what do you mean? You think that's that you think that's more that's the most important question. Oh, the resources. No. Yeah. Oh, oh, everything comes down to money. Um, so the Port Authority invests more in its terminals than it does if you go to the thirty third Street station of the path or the or the Fourteenth Street station or the Christopher Street station because they can because there's money to be made from airports, but there isn't any money to be made from the path. So when they think about where they're going to put their money. They're thinking, oh, we can build new parking facilities at the airport. We can get that money back in five years. You put the money into the path station, you're not going to get your money back. And airport access is a money loser. Uh, Mark Black, when was the decision made to stop having east and west side air terminals? Airports is the theme of the night. <laughs> Well, I wish you were in person because then I could point and say, does anybody know the answer to that one? Because I don't. No. Uh, Beverly asks, I was expecting more of this. Uh, where do you see congestion pricing going? All right. So um, I understand all the benefits of congestion pricing in New York. I think the MTA desperately needs the resources, like a billion dollars a year, not to actually do anything new, but just to keep up um, with the, the the backlog of work it needs to do on the tracks and the signals and the stations and its maintenance facilities. So the money's desperately needed. Now, personally, I think it's a good place to get it, but they're asking New Jersey folks to pay, but New Jersey folks aren't going to get the benefit. So I think some of that money, if it went into service across the Hudson, promoting bus service or promoting tran or train service, I think congestion pricing wouldn't be hitting all of the, the those walls that it's hitting right now. And I think it would be better off for everybody. And it's probably where it's going to end up at the end, but lawsuits, yelling, screaming first. Um, Francie writes, uh, New Jersey Senator Men Menendez announced this afternoon, 52 million, uh, I think 52 million, 52 MIO, assuming for the two million for the port infrastructure development program will now be earmarked for shoring up the uh aggregate jersey port facilities is this the death knell for the new york waterfront revitalization for new york waterfront revitalization as a commercial thoroughfare for cargo um there's not much left to the new york waterfront when it comes to commercial piers and i don't think there's many people in New York who really think it makes sense to get rid of Brooklyn Bridge Park and bring container ships in or to take the Hudson River Park and put a whole bunch of new warehouses in and bring more ships in and more trucks. Um, I think we have made a decision in the New York area that there are certain parts of the waterfront that should just be more recreational. And I think for the quality of life and attracting people and attracting businesses and attracting tourists, I think that's the way we should go. I think we should keep the high line the way it is. I don't think we should put rail freight back on the high line either. Um, why hasn't the authority been involved in the effort to create thorough, through running, to create through running, the effort to have New Jersey Transit, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, Con MTA run through train 
run trains through Penn Station. So I just want to tell you there's a difference between the old Port Authority from like 50, 60 years ago and today. Um, remember I talked about independence? Um, yeah. That's really important to think about. And also, who's on the board of the Port Authority? So it used to be the real movers and shakers of the region would be on the board, um, the head of the telephone company, the head of the biggest banks. But the head of those big companies aren't on those boards anymore because the head of Citibank or Goldman Sachs, they're not New York City banks anymore. They're not regional banks anymore. They're national and global institutions. Oh. So you don't have those powerful players on the board who can make these independent decisions and then really promote projects that make sense for the region. Instead, you have people who are more beholden to the governors and the governors are making these major decisions. And if the governor says, Port Authority, don't get involved with through running of trains, I think personally it'd be great if New Jersey Transit could go from Hicksville on Long Island to, to Metro Park in New Jersey um, instead of switching and um, making it hard for people to get around. Um, I, but that's not, the, the Port Authority is kind of constrained. It's on a leash. Um, you know what I think would be really wonderful in the region? And maybe Lou Gambaccini would have been able to pull it off, bring all the agencies together and say, hey, let's use that same fare. We have the same electronic tag to drive from place to place. Why do we have all of these different fares for the PATH and New Jersey Transit and the private bus carriers, the Long Island Railroad and the, the, and the ferries? And wouldn't it be great if you could get a monthly pass and you get unlimited rides on all the transit in the region and employers could give that to their employees? You get, you get people to take transit more than they otherwise would. You get cars off the road, air would be cleaner. You'd have more space for all sorts of wonderful things. Um, you, gotta, you gotta get everybody together in order to do that kind of thing. So there is governance is important. Maybe more than resources on that one. I I my my cousin, my relatives were visiting from Denmark this summer and they, and they all they all said that endlessly and I I couldn't agree with them more. Um uh Benjamin Huff asks uh how could the authority become a leader uh, the poor authority become a leader for bus improvements in the region. Okay. So when I worked on my Tap and Z book, it was really more than the Tap and Z. It was a land use book and it was an alternative transportation book, but it was sort of centered around this little Tap and Z story because um, that was the interesting part of it. Um, and I remember talking to the people who were working on bus lanes in Long Island for the State Department of Transportation, who worked in a different office than who were working on bus lanes in the Hudson Valley. And they weren't coordinating with each other and they should have because then the MTA could connect these bus lanes. And then there was different people working on bus lanes in the city of New York. And then there were people in New Jersey who were working on bus lanes too, all completely disconnected from each other and nobody was bringing them together. So to me, it's, hey, everybody come on together and let's put a vision together for how we could make buses move a little bit faster. Um, it's in the city, you can have uh, the buses timed uh, so they can go through the, the lights a little bit faster than the cars. Um, you can have separate lanes for buses. You can have better... Um, more efficient bus routes that go, that go between the two different states. Um, there's a lot of things you could do to make buses a little bit faster. Um, but if you don't work together, you can have, it's sort of like a bike lane. Imagine if you build a quarter mile bike lane in Brooklyn and Park Slope, and then you built a half a mile in Cobble Hill, and then you built a, another mile in Bed-Stuy, and you have to go bike lane through the streets, bike lane through the streets. We kind of have that, right? I mean, and, but and... The bike, I think the bike lanes are phenomenal now because they're They've been really designed in a way to be integrated so much better. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, um, uh, I was thinking, you know, but but this is, you know, we were talking, we were emailing earlier today about this. You know, I mean, this is these were sort of notes that uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was who, a big transportation uh, um, sort of uh, person who understood the value the importance of transportation. He was making these complaints in in the sixties, uh, just the lack of coordination in all this planning and building, and and it's yeah. it's sadly a perennial um, theme. Um, we are we're at a minute to eight o'clock, and there and and um, I want to thank everybody else who's. There's a bunch of other comments here. Uh, we were corrected on on uh, the. Uh, Airplane crash. There was, there was, there's apparently uh, the crash in Park Slope, which I, I didn't know about. I'd forgotten, yeah. and apparently something else in 
in Staten Island. Um, and um, uh, anyone else that had uh, that's a question, of course, can write to me, or uh, you can uh, you can find Philip online and 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 harass him as well. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Philip, I want to say congratulations to you and to Jen. Um, I am so glad that we got you back here. Um, I'm sorry we don't have more time to talk about it. Um, the book is great. There is really so much more in it. Um, and I encourage you all to go out and buy a copy. Um, and I hope that our paths cross sooner than later. So congratulations and thanks for coming to the Gotham Center. Great. And again, it was an honor and and fun to chat with you. Great. Okay. Good to have you. Take care. See you soon.